Well, I want to say welcome again to Cross Community. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm the lead pastor and one of the elders here. And uh, if you're a guest, I just want to say uh, welcome. We're really delighted that you're here. Uh, whether you're a guest here in person or in our youth area or if you're watching online, we are. We're just thankful that you're here. Uh, Brandon said earlier that our mission is to lead all people to become fully devoted disciples of Jesus Christ. And, and here's what that means. We don't think that you're here on this earth by chance. We don't think that we're here just to kind of live good lives and, you know, kind of make our way through the world, hopefully um, making more money over time and living, you know, a little bit better uh, in terms of our overall situation. But rather, we think that you were created in Christ Jesus for good works and that Jesus died on the cross. The reason that Jesus left the 99 and chased after you was not just that you could live a good life one day in eternity, but that you could begin to live the abundant life both right here and right now and in eternity. So today what I want to do in speaking to you is just to challenge you a bit to look at your life in particular as we prepare for the upcoming year and look at the steps that you're taking, the things that you're prioritizing, the things that you're doing in life, and hopefully I, I will encourage you to focus your life more on the things that matter most. Now, uh, about 10 years ago or so, I, I got a phone call from our former pastor. His name's Brian, if you didn't know him. And uh, there's something a little bit wrong with Brian. I, should, I didn't know this at the time, uh, but I learned it over the years. Brian is one of those guys that loves to punish himself. So when it comes to any sort of athletic endeavor or outdoor activity, if you're going with Brian, you're going to be in pain the next day. That's just how he is. He's one of those guys that run like the, he did the full iron man. Uh, when you hike with Brian, you don't just like hike and enjoy the scenery. You are, you're going to try to keep a certain mile per hour rate so that you make sure you're hiking as fast as you should and beat your record the last time. Brian is just like uh, outdoorsy stuff. He's just super intense. Ten years ago, I had no idea about that. So I get a phone call and Brian says, hey, we're going to go on this backpacking trip. Would you like to come? And I'm like, and I'm from eastern Oklahoma. I've been in the mountains. I'm in, whatever. So I get a backpack together. I show up. We head down to a little place in Arkansas. And this overall hike was supposed to be about 20 miles or so. And I'm like, eh, I can do it. I'm in fair shape. I was about 30 at the time. And I didn't know, uh, I had no idea just how intense this hike was going to be. So straight out of the gate, I swear, uh, we hiked for two miles, like straight up. I mean, it went on and on and on. And you think, I'm going to reach the top of this hill and life's going to get better. But it was brutal for what felt like miles. And, I, you know, honestly, I was struggling. I'm carrying a pack. I'm wearing, like, old hunting boots because I don't have all the hiking gear. And so I'm just trying to push through and hoping no one notices how bad I'm struggling. Now, I will say I was a bit relieved when like the 20-year-old guys were also struggling. Brian has left us all behind because he's Mr. In Shape. He probably like jogged up the side of the mountain, but I couldn't do that. And finally, we make it to the top of the hill, and I'm like, yes, like things are getting a little bit easier. We head down into a valley, and the next thing I see is a, a river that's about 60 feet wide, and uh, I'm like, what are we supposed to do? Like it's, it's spitting snow at this point outside. I'm like, I don't want to get my clothes wet. And Brian's like, well, yeah, take your boots and your pants off and wait it. So I strip down in the middle of winter, and I wade across a river 60 feet, and like every rock on the bottom of the creek, I've got a pack on my back, is like stabbing into my feet. It was pretty miserable, to be honest with you. But I get to the other side, I get dressed again, and continue on. I think we hiked 12 miles on the first day. We camp out overnight, um, and the temperature dropped to, I think, in the teens. And it was so cold in my tent that my water bottle froze solid. I shivered all next night, all that night. I had to sleep next to a bunch of dudes, which is never the most fun thing. We didn't eat all that well. Um, this was a pretty rough hike. Matter of fact, it was so cold that night that one of the guys in our group, uh, he got hypothermia. And so everybody else in our group besides Brian and myself was smart enough to go home at that point. They're like, you know what, uh, we've gone far enough. We're just going to take the road out of here and be done. And I was like, well, you know, I think I can keep going. Uh, it was cold last night. It was kind of miserable. But I, honestly, I was being a bit prideful. I'm like, hey, 
all those 20 year olds, they couldn't hang, you know, and like, here I am, I'm still making it. So we took off and I'm feeling good about myself, you know, because I've never really hiked like this before and I'm still going and, and life is good. We get within four miles of the end of our journey, just me and Brian. And again, I'm like having to jog to keep up with him because he's making sure he's keeping the correct mile per hour at his hiking pace. Um, and we come to this little creek and thank goodness we didn't have to strip down and like wade through and all that. Uh, but it was just kind of a dance across these rocks. And again, feeling pretty good about myself. Uh, I, I go to move across the rocks, and it, I guess the fatigue, lactic acid builds up in your muscles. I didn't sleep well that night. Um, I didn't step with quite the nimbleness that I should have, and uh, I, I like my foot slips off of a rock, and it wasn't like one of those, hey, just kind of slipped and bumped back out of the water. This was one of those falls that took three or four seconds in the making where I'm doing everything I can to catch myself. I end up soaking both feet, my right leg, like my right hip is wet, and then the next four miles of that hike was the most miserable four miles of my life. Um, my boots were waterproof, which means they don't let water in, but they also don't let it out. And so my feet were soaking wet. I was freezing. I was tired. I was hungry. And I was exhausted. Four miles of misery. And with every step, I was like, man, I wish I would have paid just a little more attention. I wish I would have been a little more careful. I didn't realize that I was getting tired. I didn't realize that maybe I was getting a little sore. If I had only known, I would have been more careful. Now, if you've lived very long in this life, you've probably said something similar, probably not about a hike, but about your life. Maybe for you, when you think about the journey of your life, the path that you've walked, you can look back at times and think, man, I wish I'd have placed my step a little more carefully. I wish I would have made a little bit better decision. I wish I'd never gone there. I wish I'd never connected with that person. I wish that I would have done things differently. You see, looking back, hindsight is indeed 2020. We can see things that we should have done. As a matter of fact, you may have like regrets and things that you're like, gosh, that's been so painful. As you look back, you can see things in your life that have been costly, both to you personally maybe even to people in your life, you think, man, I wish I would have done things differently. Now, the trouble is we can't go back. I couldn't go back and undo that step and make myself not wet anymore. I couldn't, like, go and and fix that. Uh, But one thing that we can do as disciples of Jesus Christ, people who are uh, wanting to live a good life here, who want to take advantage of all that we have in Christ Jesus, um, we can't go back and fix the things that we've done in the past. But you know what we can do? We can begin to move forward in greater wisdom than we have before. Here we are at the end of the year. We've made our way through the holidays. I'm sure you guys all had a a wonderful Christmas. That's my hope and my prayer that you celebrated Jesus well. Um, Here at the end of the year, I just want to challenge you guys to look forward to next. And not just next year, but maybe even 10 years and beyond. And and as you think about, like, what do I want to see in my life? Like, what, what would I desire? Uh, For me, one of the things I pray every morning is, God, would you help me to be a godly man, a godly husband, a godly father, a godly pastor, and a godly friend? Like, those are five things that I want in my life that if nothing else happens, if I never make millions of dollars, if I never, like, win a big athletic competition or whatever it might be, God, I want these five things in my life above any other thing. I want to be a godly man, husband, father, pastor, and So I want to encourage you this morning to think forward, to look ahead and say, what are the things that I would like to see manifested in my life? What are the things that when I uh, reach the end of my life and look back, what are the things I would have wished I would have invested more time in? If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Now, Paul was writing a letter to the church in Ephesus. Men and women who, although they existed a couple of thousand years ago, would have been much like you and me. They wanted to live good lives. They wanted their children to do well and to have a good marriage. Like They wanted to live a good life. And yet these are men and women who had come to faith in Jesus Christ. It's likely that one of their elders or someone would have stood up in their congregation and read this letter aloud. And here's what Paul has said to them so far. He said, remember, before you knew Christ, do you remember when you were dead in trespasses and sins? Do you remember those regrets? Remember those hurts and those pains, those things that you used to walk in? Now, the good news 
is that you're no longer dead in trespasses and sins. The good news that you've, is that you've been made alive together with Christ. And then Paul tells them that they are his, they are God's workmanship. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works, so get busy walking in them. And then Paul kind of gets after them a little bit. I'm not sure what was going on among the people at the church of, at Ephesus, but apparently they'd gotten into some things. So he's like, hey, quit living according to the way that you used to live. Remember those broken things you used to be involved with, those sinful behaviors that have only cost you pain? Stop living like that. And at the beginning of chapter 5, he instead says, hey, quit imitating the world. Start imitating Christ. And look at the life that Jesus lived. If you're followers of Jesus, you ought to be following Jesus. That means beginning to live like him and in, instead of living like the world. And he jumps down in verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 5. And he begins to instruct them very practically in what this should ultimately look like. Here's what he said to that church. He says, Therefore, because you have been made alive together with Christ, because you have this awesome life that God wants to give you, this abundant and full life that he wants you to live, where your life has meaning and purpose and it counts for something. Therefore, be careful how you walk. Not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. He's telling the the church at Ephesus that all of the world, all of culture is going to be pressing against you like a strong current, right? The days are evil. If you just kind of drift in this life, the currents of this world is not going to lead you in a Godward direction. That you're not going to experience the life that you always desired. You're not going to live fullness in Jesus Christ by default. As a matter of fact, the days are evil. And so if you just kind of bow to culture, you bow to the, the normal forces of this world, you're not going to wind up where you want. So he says, instead, be very careful how you walk which means pay attention. This is the thing that I wish I could have told myself before I fell off of the boulder into the creek. Hey, 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 watch this. Be really careful where you're going to place your next step because it's consequential. Be very careful then how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. Making the most of your time. Now, this would suggest that there are lots of things that we could choose from, right? Like, there's a lot of options that we could, you know, pursue in this life. Uh, Maybe for you, you're still chasing after that athletic career. You're like me, you're like 40, and it's never going to happen, but you're still clinging to hope. Uh, Maybe for you, it's going to be like financial success. Maybe for you, you just have something that you would really like to accomplish in this life. And what Paul is telling the believers at Ephesus is, hold on. There are only so many things you can pursue. There's only so much time. So you've got to make the most of it. In following after Jesus, and you gotta, you got to do the things that are going to produce the most return on your investment of your time, if you will. Think about the things that are going to produce the best return for your investment of your time. Now, when he says, be careful how you walk here, this is the Greek word parapeteo. If you know what a parapet is, uh, basically it's just kind of this thing that, that teeters one foot to the next. What he's calling our attention to is literally how you step. Like, be careful where you place your foot. Be careful what decisions that you're ultimately going to make because every decision is going to have consequences. And he tells us what that looks like. He says, not as unwise men, but as wise. Anybody in here have children? Anyone have moments, maybe moments of great frustration, where your child uh, makes a mistake that they just made. Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's a mistake that they're like, I'm so sorry, I had no idea. And you're like, yes, you did. You just made the same mistake 10 minutes ago. Uh, For me, this is drink spilled in my living room. Um, we've made a rule in my house, like, hey, if you have soda, you have, to, you have anything that's going to stain, you don't bring it into the living room, because what happens over and over and over when they set the can on the carpet or the drink, and then they're playing on an Xbox or whatever they're doing, that thing gets spilled in the carpet, and I lose my mind, right? I get frustrated that something has happened, something's been spilled, and, and I'll say to them, like, hey, like, I've told you, like, don't leave your drink there. Like, you just spilled one yesterday, and you made the same mistake. And they act as if they've never heard before that they shouldn't have done that. Like, I had no idea that drinks spilled on carpet. Like, yes, you did. It's happened ten times, right? Paul's like, 
Hey, don't live as unwise men, but instead as wise. We might kind of laugh at kids spilling drink in the same way over and over and over, but you know what we have a tendency to do in our lives? To chase after the same empty ends over and over and over. To give ourselves to things that in the end they won't matter. And although they might be more refined, more mature pursuits, they're just as foolish. Rather than pursuing the things that are going to produce the return that we want to see, rather than pursuing the things that are of wisdom, we pursue the things of this world, unwise things that, that won't make us happy, won't make us fulfilled, maybe even make us angry or cause us pain. You see, as we look back to things in our lives that have cost us pain in the past, as we look ahead, we need to remember that those, th still op those options still exist for us. We could still walk in those same things again and experience the same hurts that have come as a result. So Paul, instructing these believers at Ephesus, hey, be very careful how you walk. Not as foolish people repeating the same things over and over again, the same mistakes, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So I want to give you just three quick ways to watch your walk, all right? As you look forward to 2021, a believer in Jesus Christ who's like, man, I want to be a godly man. I want to be a godly woman. I want to have the kind of marriage that, that people would look at and be like, hey, I want that too. As you look forward to, to the riches that we have in Christ Jesus, I want to give you just three areas that you need to walk, watch when it comes to your walk. Number one is this. In 2021, as your pastor, I want to encourage you to be diligent about your devotion. Be diligent about your devotion. Jesus, in, in John chapter 15 and verse 5, he, he said it this way, and it's so stark. It's like so like clear for us. He said, I'm the vine, and you're a branch. The one who abides in me, the one who remains connected to me, that's the man that's going to bear much fruit. That's the woman whose life is going to bear the good fruit that we all want to see. Like we all want more love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. Like we want those things in our lives. Jesus is like, hey, I'm the vine. I am the source of all those good things. And if you want to see them manifested in your life, remain connected to me. And then he, he continues to, to teach us there. Like I'm the vine, you're the branch. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. But apart from me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. Apart from Christ, disconnected from him, man, we can labor and we can strive and we can plan and we can work and we can like read the books and do all the things. But apart from Christ, those godly ends that we pursue, those dreams that we have for our, our kids or our marriage, they're never going to come to fruition. So I encourage you as you look ahead to your year to be diligent about your devotion because apart from him you can do nothing. But if you remain connected to Christ, even with your sinful tendencies and your weaknesses, even with your lack of knowledge about parenting or whatever the thing it might be in your life, if you remain connected to Christ, your life will bear much fruit. When we talk about that here, we just call it devoting daily. Which means you, you get up in the mornings if you're that kind of person. Or you, you stay up late in the evenings and you open up the word of God. And you're like, hey God, would you teach me? Would you give me the wisdom that I need to live a godly life here? Would you help me to pursue the things that are going to bring you glory and bear fruit in my life? And to leave the other stuff behind. Devoting ourselves daily to Christ and his word. Jesus said, if any man would come after me, and you want to be a disciple? Deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. Deny yourself daily even. So we get up in the morning or we stay up late in the evenings. We take up our cross once again. Devoting ourselves once again to Jesus Christ. Saying, hey, God, I'm not, I'm not here to pursue a job. God, I'm not here to make a bunch of money or to achieve some level of success. God, I'm here to follow you. So would you do your work in me? The first thing I want to challenge you in is being diligent about your devotion. Spending time both in the Word and connected to God in prayer. Living a life that's sensitive to the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life. 
Where as you go about your day, you're kind of in this constant conversation with God. Hey, God, I got this meeting. I want to represent you well. Would you, would you give me the grace to, to follow you in this? Would you give me the grace to, that my speech might be seasoned with salt? You see, what God wants is not to, like, download all this power. I don't know if you've ever heard, like, preaching that talks a lot about power and this and that, almost like God infuses it into you and then you go and live your life alone. Like, that's not at all how God wants us to live. But instead, what God wants us to do is to come to him every single day, to receive from him on that day everything that we need to live for that day. I heard someone once say that spiritual nourishment is perishable. Spiritual nourishment is perishable, which means uh, God gives you enough for today, but not necessarily enough for tomorrow. You, you remember in the Old Testament when the Israelites were, were living in Egypt and God leads them out of the bondage in Egypt and into the, the wilderness? And the people are like, hey, God, like we had food in Egypt. We might have been slaves there, but we, we had food. Now here we are in the wilderness where there's not a lot of food. Like we don't have adequate water. And what God chose to do uh, among his people at that point was to feed them every morning. And so they would wake up and there would be manna, a wafer-like substance on the ground. And they could go and they could eat until they were full. The unique thing about that manna is it would kind of burn off as the, the dew went away, if you will. And they couldn't keep it overnight. It would spoil. And every single day, God would feed his people. They would get up in the morning and would go and receive that nourishment that God provided day after day after day in the middle of the wilderness where they couldn't have fed themselves. God fed them. The same is true for us. In a spiritual sense, God wants to feed us every single day. So as you look forward to 2021, your, your habits that you want to establish, your behaviors that you want to pursue, I want to encourage you to be diligent about your devotion. There is no greater gift that you will ever give to yourself or to your family, or to your friends, or anyone else in your life than the time that you spend with Jesus Christ. So be diligent about your devotion. Number two, I want to encourage you to be careful about your companions. Be careful about your companions, the people that you would choose to spend time with. Now, um, this is not that we shun people who aren't like us. This is not like we're going to ignore people who believe a little bit differently, have different political perspectives. That's not it at all. This is simply being careful about the people that we allow into our lives, the people that we're going to allow to influence us. Um, the writer of Proverbs in Proverbs 13, 20 says, He who walks with wise men will become wise. But the companion of fools will suffer harm. Whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not, you are ultimately going to become like the people that you spend the most time with. I, I realized this when I was in, in student ministry. Um, there would be like words and phrases that would come through, and I would hear one student start to use this phrase, and then it would like kind of filter through all of our other students, and I wouldn't know what it meant at first. There would be this new saying, my children, I can tell when they've been watching YouTube because they say things in odd ways. Did you know that you don't search things on the Internet anymore? If, if, you're, if you're a legit YouTuber, nowadays you search things up. I got to search it up. And I asked my kid, like, why are you saying that? They can't help but pick up the lingo of the people that they pay attention to. They can't help but become like the people that they're, they're following after. And the same is true for us as adults. We've got to be careful about our companions. Here's what the Apostle Paul said to the church at Ephesus. He says, don't be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Don't get drunk with wine, that's dissipation, but instead be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Now, you might think it would be an odd thing to be like walking up to each other and just start, start singing a song, right? That would be kind of odd. What Paul is referencing here is the gathering of believers in the church at Ephesus. That as they would come together, they would sing songs together. They would remind each other of the goodness of God in the midst of what might have been difficult circumstances. They would encourage one another with these words, with these songs. They didn't have the scriptures as we have them now. They would have preserved much of their knowledge in the form of a song. So he's like, hey, gather together, encourage one another in songs. 
Like, get around people that can lift you up when times are difficult. And then at the end, he says, and be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Is this hard for the American church to hear? That you are not supposed to blaze your own trail when it comes to your own spirituality. Like, you're, God never intended for you to run this race alone. He intended for you to run this race in community with other believers where other people have the freedom to speak into your life. This, this word being subject here, it means to submit yourself to them. You know, the tragedy of the American church is like we run really hard. We run really fast. We think no one's going to tell me my own way. I'm going to, you know, it's my faith, my relationship with Jesus. I'm not very public about those sorts of things. The, the tragedy for us is we, we oftentimes we want to run after Jesus. Like we want to pursue all the right things, but we don't realize that there's a little blind spot back here somewhere that we didn't know, and we never recognize our blind spots until it's too late, until we've gone off the ledge and had the affair, until we find ourselves headlong in the addiction, until our marriage is completely crumbling. And the truth of it is, if we've been diligent and careful about our companions, if we've been careful to surround our, ourselves with godly men and women to whom we would submit, they could have spoken truth in our lives before the accident happened. We do counseling around here, and people will often call, hey, hey, the marriage is in trouble, and I've got this addiction in my life, and and I know it's, it's our joy to walk with people through difficult circumstances. Like, that's part of the, the role of the church. But you know what's even better than walking with people through the midst of disaster in their life? Is walking with them before they get there. And loving them enough to, to warn them about what was ultimately coming. If you don't have people in your life that you've given permission to, that you've said, I'm going to submit myself to them, that walk with you close enough to observe the steps that you're taking, the decisions that you make. If you don't have people in your life that you're walking with closely enough and that love you enough to tell you the truth, whether you know it or not, you're headed for disaster because there are weaknesses in your life, there are blind spots that you have that you don't even know exist. Around here, we, our, our language, we say we want people to gather consistently with the body of Christ, and we want people to commit themselves to community. And so what we ask you to do is be a part of a community group and do life with people. They get to see the good and the bad and the ugly. Uh, tonight, my community group's going to come to my house, and it's still a stinking mess, y'all. Like all the Christmas stuff, it's like we got more stuff and no more room, and it's going to be ugly. And, you know, my, my community group, they get to observe uh, my best moments with my wife. And they get to see the ones that I'm not super proud of, right? The times where uh, there are moments of weakness. We do life together. We tell one another the truth. They have the courage and the permission to speak into my life and say, hey, that's, that's not how you speak to your spouse. That's not loving her as Christ loved the church. So I want to encourage you as well. Be diligent about your devotion. But be careful about your companions, the people that you allow into your life that have influence with you, that you're going to walk through life with. Because it can make the difference between you running that race well, fulfilling the purpose God had for you in the sense of walking in all those good works, and instead going off the rails and having another one of those accidents you look back on and think, man, I wish someone would have told me. The final thing I want to encourage you uh, in today as you think about 2021, diligent about your devotion, careful about your companions, and the final piece is be mindful about your mission. Your life was never meant to be about you. And as long as it is, you will never be satisfied. As long as your life is about you and your happiness and your stuff and your family, and there's always going to be a component of you that's lacking, is because you were made to live on mission. You were made to be a part of God's plan, pointing to something greater than yourself. Earlier in Ephesians, Paul says that you are God's workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared in advance. Like, you are like a tool that was crafted for a very specific purpose. There is nobody that can run the race that God has marked out for you better than you can if you'll submit yourself to Christ. Like, God didn't want anyone else to be your spouse's spouse. God didn't want anyone else to be your children's parents. God didn't want anyone else to be your friend's friend. Like, that is the race that he has marked out for you. But oftentimes we, we lose sight of that fact and we start to live our lives as if it's about us. Lose sight of the mission that God has called us to. Just before Jesus left this earth, he gathers his disciples together and he says, Hey, um, as you're living your lives, as you're going about your, your work and your play and all the things that you're going to do, I want you to make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. God created you on purpose for a purpose, and that's to make disciples everywhere you go. Please don't go to work to an empty and meaningless job again. And every day when you leave your house, understand you're entering the mission field. And every day when you walk back home from work and you walk in that door, understand you're entering a mission field. And every time you find yourself at the grocery store or at a family gathering or at the ball fields, understand you have entered your mission field. Like God created you for that moment. God created you for that environment. And he is empowering you by his spirit to make disciples there. Now, that does not mean that you stand on the street and you just preach the gospel nonstop everywhere you go, but it does mean that you act like Jesus would have acted if he were walking in your shoes on that day, that you will show the same compassion toward the people you encounter as Jesus would have showed, that you would love people as Jesus loved them, that you would be the kind of dad that Jesus would be, or the kind of mom that Jesus would be in your home, that you are mindful of your mission and you have been called to make disciples. Now, we encourage people in three ways here at Cross Community. Uh, the first is just serving faithfully. Like You have been given a spiritual gift. Every one of us has that's a part of this body of Christ, a spiritual gift that is to, to be employed for the building up of this body. And so like some people would be like, yeah, I don't preach, I don't sing, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Uh, you don't know this right now, but you are being served by a gifted group of men and women who are uh, blessing our kids in the nursery and in our children's area. There were people who showed up here over the holiday weekend that they were cleaning and preparing this facility for you. We have people that are gifted administrators that are busy working to build up this body of Christ, and we need your gift too. As a matter of fact, if you're not serving somewhere in this church, this church is limping because we're missing the gift that God has given to you. Like, you were created for good works, and one of those is that you would be a faithful part of this body, using your gifts to build up the rest of the church here. The second thing that I would encourage you in, in terms of being mindful of mission, is that you would be giving sacrificially. God has entrusted Maybe a whole lot to you and maybe just a little. He hasn't called you to be the biggest giver, but he has called you to be faithful with what he has given. And so one of the things we ask you to do as a part of Cross Community Church is to give sacrificially, both to the work that's going to happen here and as you go out in your day and you encounter people in need. Like we, we would never want to be like, oh, I put some money in a plate, so I'm off the hook. No, we, we live our lives on mission. So Jesus would say, if you, if you see someone who's in need, what you don't do is say, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed. No, you go and meet the need that you would intentionally, as you think about 2021, set aside a percentage of your income. And I wouldn't go for what's convenient, and I wouldn't go for what's easy. As a matter of fact, the Scripture would tell us we should be rich toward God, that we should seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and that all the other things that might concern us, God will take care of those. But I would encourage you to set aside a percentage of your income that might make you feel it, that might make you uncomfortable, to invest that treasure into the kingdom of God. And you would have money that you're like, hey, this is going to go to the church. And that you would have money that would be like, hey, this is going to meet the needs that I'm going to encounter. And I'm not going to go buy the new thing and get the new payment and such that there's no money left. But instead, we're going to intentionally set aside money throughout this year that we could be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ in terms of our giving and meeting physical and tangible needs. Mindful of your mission, serving faithfully, giving sacrificially. And the final thing is that you would engage missionally. And here, here's what I want to challenge you to do. 
as a part of Cross Community Church this year, that you would commit yourself to sharing the gospel and leading one person to Christ this year. Now, I hope that that number would be like tenfold for you. I hope that you're like leading someone to Christ every day, but that you would just say, God, I, I got to start somewhere. And maybe if you're, you're here, you've never led anyone to Christ. You've never actually shared the gospel. You'd be like, God, in 2021, I want to lead someone to faith in Jesus Christ. And so I'm going to articulate the gospel. I'm going to encourage men and women to follow after you. And really, you, you realize what happens then. Like next year... Five or six or seven hundred more people are following after Jesus Christ because each of us picked just one. So God, would you just let me lead one person to you? We engaged missionally rather than coasting through life as if like there isn't the kingdom of God at hand, as if hell isn't real and and heaven isn't also a reality for people. But we would say, I'm going to engage missionally and I'm going to make sure somebody knows Jesus Christ. Maybe as I'm speaking today, God's placed that name on your heart like that's the one. And you need to go after them. You need to start praying for them right now. And this year, you're going to share the gospel with them in the hopes that they're going to trust Jesus Christ too. It is my hope and prayer for us that in the midst of a world that is, the days are evil, in the midst of the kind of the, the tidal wave that's pushing against us, the current of culture that would lead us to waste our time on things that don't matter, that we would walk as wise men and women making the most of our time, even though the days are evil. Can I pray for you today? Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be a people, God, that you would use for your glory. God, we recognize that we can't accomplish anything apart from you. So at the very beginning, Father, we come to you and we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit who lives within us, that we might live victorious and abundant lives in you, that we wouldn't settle for the emptiness that we used to live in, the dead lives that we had before. God, that we wouldn't sit on the sidelines bored with Christianity, wondering why we're not enthralled by it. But God, we would instead, we would get in the game. We would, we would kind of engage in our mission and say, God, would you use me to do something I know I could never do apart from you? Lord Jesus, may we move forward in wisdom, seeking after you as faithful disciples, living as you lived. The God who left the 99 and chased after the one. God, may we leave the 99, what's comfortable, what's easy, what's familiar. May we chase after the one. Father, we, we love you and we praise you and we just ask that you might have your way in our midst today. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.